Boy, what a crowd we've got. Can everybody hear all the way back there? It's good to be here. It's good to be with y'all. I'm glad we've I'm glad we've kind of gotten back almost in a in a normal way of doing things. But I'm thankful that we have with some services at least where it can be shared or broadcast uh, in other places. People can pick up uh, the lessons on Sunday morning at least for, uh, and, and times that Carrie is preaching on uh, YouTube and Facebook. And that's, that's a good thing to be able to do. I had a friend that just recently retired from the sheriff's office in uh, San Angelo in Tom Green County. And he had announced this and people were sending notices, you know, uh, congratulations, Terry, glad that you're able to do this and, and you'll have time for fishing and golfing and had all of these things that people were suggesting that maybe he'd be able to do. It seemed like that we go through, many people go through looking for the good life. You ever kind of heard people along that, when I retire someday, someday, things are going to be better someday. People look for the good life. Back in about, when did I, I got my master's in 1983, I believe, I was preaching here. And, um, and, and the elders let me take some time to go up and to really work on my paper. And we had a little pop-up camper then. And I went up, I believe it was Falcon Lake. There's nobody else around except one camper back off to the side with, with one fella that was over there. And I would work on that old typewriter. Um, you guys back there may not know what a typewriter is but it's kind of like a computer, only it's not hooked up to anything. And if you make a mistake, you have to white it out, and if you have too many of them, then uh, you, you have to do a paper all over again. But I was working on that on the, on the typewriter, and I'd work a little bit, and then I'd get up and I'd go jogging. And then I'd come back and I'd work some more. And that fellow over there at that other camper, he, he would, took a chair out there and he sat there and he started feeding, pitching something out for birds or squirrels. And he did that all day long. That was what he did. You've heard of Clint Eastwood? Have you heard of Toby Keith? Clint Eastwood and Toby Keith were playing golf at some type of tournament. They were riding in Clint Eastwood's golf cart. And as they were riding along and talking, Eastwood said that he had a birthday coming up. And I think it was his 88. And Toby Keith asked him what he was going to do to celebrate. He said, I'm going to make a movie. He said, well, I'm going to make a movie. He said, how do you keep going? And I wrote this down. He said, I just get up every day and don't let the old man in. Amen. And Toby Keith, after that left, it was in his mind, and he he wrote a song, and that's what it's called, Don't Let the Old Man In. And then he got in touch with somebody with Eastwood and told him he'd written that song and would like to send it to him. Well, he got the song, and Clint Eastwood put it in the movie that he was making. And that's the theme for the movie, The Mule. I didn't think I wanted to see that. I kind of think I do now. I thought it was just, it's, it's, it's about an older person that is, is transporting drugs. He gets caught up into this. And I thought, 
And I don't want anything that glorifies the drug culture. But then somebody told me, no, that's really not what it's about. I'd like to see that movie sometime. Now then, the point is, here's this one fella that maybe he felt he had the good life because now he could sit over here and feed squirrels or birds. And Clint Eastwood is still trucking along and making movies, and I suspect that he feels he's got the good life. In counseling, I'd heard someplace a long time ago, and I've used this in working with people, there are three things that everybody needs. Someone to love, something to do, and something to hope for. Now that, that's, that's just in counseling. But folks, we've got that. And we've got that fellow that feeds the squirrels, and we've got Clint Eastwood, and anybody else that's looking for the good life, if they're not Christians, we've got them beat. Because we have someone to love, and fortunately we have church family as well as our families in the flesh, our household. And we've got something to do if we serve our Lord. And we've got something great to hope for. In John 10 and verse 10, the Lord said, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that you may have life and that they may have it abundantly. In contrast to the selfishness of the thief who came to destroy, Jesus came to give life. The Amplified New Testament reads this way. He says, I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. The life that Jesus gives is richer, although it's more full, it's greater than any, anybody, anything can provide. Some people go through life looking for the time, well, when I retire. And, you know, I've even heard people say things like, well, I can't wait till my kids are grown. That, that, that's a sad thing. You know, we have enjoyed, and I believe most of y'all have, we've enjoyed our children at every age, haven't we? It's such a thrill to be able to see them. And then they come grandkids. It's a great, it's a great experience to have love in the family. Jesus said, by the fruit you shall know them. And if we're in Christ, it will be seen in the way that we live and in our character. Do any of you remember Paul Faulkner and Carver King? They used to do marriage seminars. They were roommates at Abilene Christian, I believe, a long time ago. And then later they were teachers and preachers, and, and, uh, and they taught at, at Abilene Christian at the time. But they had, they, had a, a, they had a marriage seminar that they would go a different place. And Sally and I attended a couple of them. It did her a lot of good. I don't know if it did me much. But anyway, I got a lot out of it, I think. But one of the things that Paul Faulkner had done someplace along there, he said that there were some vital signs that are characteristic of those who have the abundant life. Those folks who get more out of life than the average person. He listed seven. have goals, be involved in service, act better than you feel. Huh. That's a good thing to do sometimes. 
take the initiative, continue to grow, be people-oriented, and have a positive attitude. Each one of those, I believe, are something that we could spend a lot of time looking at. Uh, so many thoughts come to mind on this, but I won't, I'll try not to get sidetracked. We're gonna look a little bit at goals, being able to have goals. Our Father and His Son and the Holy Spirit, Andy had goals, or I should say they have. They are goal-oriented. In John, the first chapter, one through four, we're familiar with this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And even before the creation, there were spiritual blessings that were planned for us, for God's children. In Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 12, a little lengthy, but I'm going to read this. If you want to look at it with Scripture, the Bible, that's good. It said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we be, should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ in himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us as accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in the earth and in heaven in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having being predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be into the praise of his glory. There was purpose. There was a plan. And when we be, read back in Genesis in the first chapter, we see the plan. Let us make man in our image. And we see the creation. God planned for our salvation even before the foundation of the world. While he was on this earth, Jesus had purpose. When he was in the flesh, he knew early in his life, he was just 12 years old, Luke says. You remember the story when he, he stayed and, and his family was moving on and they lost him and they went back looking for him and when they found him, what did he say? Don't you know I must be about my father's business? And when he died on that cross, he said, it is finished. His earthly life was finished. But thank God and thank Jesus Christ for us, it was not finished because he arose, <laughs> he came back. And because of that, we will arise when this life is over. One of our sister-in-laws made a what do you call it, kind of a blanket, kind of like, like you have with Marvin, with the picture. They had a, took a picture of, they had, there was a picture of, of my mother, her older brother, her younger brother, 
and mother's mother, my granny, when they were just little kids. And you see that little girl, of course, you know, back then they didn't smile a whole lot in pictures for some reason. And that little old pretty girl with a kind of a solemn face. I was in my little office there today, or my getaway, or my doghouse, whatever you want to call it, where I can get out if Sally gets tired of me. Uh, she didn't do that. She never tired of me, Baldo. But I, I, I had that on one of my chairs, and I had a little bookmarker that we'd gotten from Mother's funeral, and I put it over there. And I look at it, and, and I said, little girl, who would have ever thought that your life would have had so many things happen in almost a hundred years. Because mother was 99 years, four months and five days when she left us. We don't know what's ahead of us. But because we're Christians, we will arise again. And some people say, well, I'm looking for heaven for the abundant life. No. When we became Christians, when we believed and repented and admitted that Jesus Christ, that we believe is the Son of God, and we were buried in that watery grave of baptism, that started our abundant life. <laughs> I love it. And there'll be ups and downs, and there'll be trials and tribulations, and but we go on through this life, and we stay faithful. And then when we depart from this whole life, when the part of us that lives forever departs from this physical that is only intended to carry us through this earthly life, when we depart, we keep living. We keep living. And isn't that wonderful? But what are we doing with this life? I appreciate so much the... Um, the lessons, the series that, that Carrie has had dealing with, with uh, shepherding. And I like that word really better than eldering, really. The series dealing with shepherds. Uh, Bazin aside, you know, we've had, we've had pigs, goats, Cows. When I was a kid, we had horses. And we've had sheep. Did you know that sheep are the dumbest of all? But the Lord says that we are sheep <laughs> that need a shepherd. <laughs> And he cares enough about us that he gave us the good shepherd. And he set up a way that with, with collectively in the house of God as Christians would be together in the local church, he set it up so that there would be designated shepherds, presbyters, overseers, elders, pastors, they're all the same. The terms apply to all the same. I appreciate so much the lessons, the series that Carrie has had. And he sent his dissertation to me, and I, I, I'd read through, be reading that. Couldn't read it all at one time, <laughs> but I'd read through. And Kelly, did you know some of the places that he looked at, some of the, some of the things that they've been doing with the congregations that he surveyed, they identified their purpose. 
they had goals. I can look back at the, at the, um, the minutes of the meetings that we've had since the time we came here and back before. We came here in October 1980. And there were some good ideas. There were some good things that were brought up. There were some good plans. But a lot of them we didn't follow through with. Someday we will have shepherds again. But we need to follow through and we need to be organized the way the Lord wants us to. You remember in 1 Samuel, when the Israelites began to complain, and they told Samuel, said, we want a king like the other nations. I'm afraid that sometimes in the Lord's church, we have become pastorized because we want a pastor like denominations. And we are not a denomination if we belong to Christ. I know of at least one preacher, and I think maybe another one, that said it in so many words, that said that he left here because he said, I couldn't get anybody to do anything. First of all, it's not the, the job of the preacher to get anybody to do anything. In 2 Timothy 4, we see that the preacher is to preach the word. To preach. To teach. To reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. But if the church is organized in the way that it ought to be, there will be the deacons and there will be the elders or shepherds, presbyters that will be doing their work. We had a business meeting not long ago. I guess you could call it that. Sometimes we'd say we have an elders meeting. We put it in the book and we have an elders meeting. And it's really not an elders meeting. It's a business meeting. And the elders and the deacons get together. And we talk about different things. It's been suggested that perhaps we would look at having business meetings. We may not do it, I don't know, but here's a thought. To have business meetings and anybody and everybody in the congregation be able to come and to offer suggestions. Or to ask questions and to get to know what, what's going on, what are we doing? And then to have a deacon's meeting to discuss those things that have been brought up and to discuss the, the physical needs of the church. I told Carrie that when I'd read through his dissertation, and also from the lessons. I said, boy, that, that stimulated some thinking. He is so sneaky. He said it was supposed to. He's sneaky. But he makes sense, doesn't he? And it'd be so good if, if then the shepherds would be able to have a meeting and really discuss those things of a spiritual nature and to pray specifically. Wouldn't it be wonderful to do things just as God wants them done? <laughs> but we got to have plans. We got to have a direction. B.C., do y'all have a mission statement?
Karen, when, when you were in the school system, didn't you have a mission statement with the system and maybe with the school itself? And uh, Ambaldo, where you worked with the plant way back in that cold country, I suspect they had a mission statement of some sort too. It might have been just we are going to be safe and everything. We have a mission statement. Jesus had said, go therefore and make all disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. Now, it's a little worded a little differently than other mission statements, but that's our purpose. In 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, toward the latter part, we see that we are ambassadors for Christ. Now, I've been places and heard places, heard preachers from one particular preacher school back years ago that they try to put a guilt trip. Kelly, make you feel like if you don't do this, you know, and, and blasting people. We want to serve because we want others to be able to enjoy the abundant life that we have. And out of love, we share with others. But what about your individual goals? Collectively, we can have some goals, and I believe that we will start developing some goals for the church collectively. But individually, what are some personal goals, perhaps, that you have in Christ? I have suggested sometimes to some people that have a good idea about something, look, go ahead and do it. But don't expect everybody else to jump on your bandwagon because not everybody will go exactly the same way. Benjamin Franklin started, my understanding, a reading was someplace, he started lighting the streets of Philadelphia. And he didn't ask anybody to do it. The story was that he bought a nice lamp and he's put made a place and set it up out by his house and he'd go out and he'd 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 clean it and shine it and put it up there and the light would shine from his lamp and you know what happened <laughs> hey Sally other people started looking at it and they're like, hmm I gotta get me one of those and after a while not too long as the neighbors began to light up their street in front of their house, Philadelphia had street lights, <laughs> street lamps, we we'll say. And that's a good thing for us to do as we love the Lord and we seek to serve, we'd be able to do it. I don't think there's a rule that we've got to go right up to the time but I want you to listen to this one other little thought. I think it's wonderful. In Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. You probably know it. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I remember times, and some of y'all have, when the preachers would preach and almost like whipping. Here's what you got to do. The Lord didn't treat, he doesn't treat us that way. He says, learn of me, follow me, and there's no place 
There's no place. God doesn't even make us do anything. But he invites us. Everybody here, as I look through, is one of my brothers or sisters in Christ. So I don't think we can call it really an invitation, but the lesson's yours, and I hope it's been worthwhile in some way for you to be here. I love y'all. I love the church here. I want us to be able to do what God wants us to. Because when we look through the valley, we see a number of congregations that no longer even meet. I'm thankful that we have the church here. I'm thankful that we have Carrie. I'm thankful that we have Hugo, two faithful men who will proclaim the gospel. And I look out and I see every other male in here that has taken a role publicly in teaching, preaching, singing. And I see faithful women of this congregation that are quick to respond to the needs of others with cards, with food, with calls. We are blessed. I am blessed to be a part of your family, of God's family. Would you bow with me for just a moment? <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blessings you've given to us. Thank you, O oh God, for the church here. Thank you, Lord, that we've not had really serious losses that I know of. We've had illnesses, but we've not lost anybody to this COVID. We have all lost loved ones. The Trevino's lost a mama. We pray you'd comfort those who have lost others. We pray you'd be with those who are ill in any way. And oh God, we pray so much that you'd help us to get on track and to do just as you want us to do as a congregation. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>